Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Center for International Governance Innovation, or CG as we say. My name is Fred Kuntz, and I'm the Vice President of Public Affairs here at CG. I'd like to begin tonight by thanking our public event sponsor, Wordsworth Books, for their ongoing support of CG's signature lecture series. And I'd especially like to thank our event co-sponsor tonight, the Balsley School of International Affairs, for making this event possible. Welcome to those joining us from around the world through our live webcast. And following this evening's address, we welcome questions from both audiences at the microphones here at CG or through the live chat function if you're watching on screen. Please remember to state your name if you're asking a question and to keep the question brief. The question of the night is, is our system of global governance in crisis? Critics point to the failure of agreement on climate change, stalemates in World Trade Organization negotiations and deadlocks at the UN Security Council, as well as failures at international financial institutions to avert the recent crisis. Tonight we have the privilege of hearing from John Ravenhill, newly appointed director of the Balsley School of International Affairs, as he addresses this very question. Our introducer and our formal thanker this evening are from the two local universities which are partners with CG in the Balsley School that Professor Ravenhill leads. The introducer, Doug Pierce, is the Dean of Arts at the University of Waterloo. And prior to his appointment in July of this year, Doug was the Dean of Graduate Studies and the Associate Vice President Graduate at York University. He has also held senior administrative roles at the University of Calgary and at the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. And the vote of thanks later will be from Deb McClatch, who is Vice President, Academic and Provost at Wilfrid Laurier University. And she was previously Dean of Science at Laurier and Dean of Science, Applied Science and Engineering at the University of New Brunswick and St. John. So please join me in welcoming Doug Pierce. Thanks, Fred. I'm delighted to be here tonight. Uh, to welcome John Ravenhill, who will bring a truly global experience and perspective to pressing questions of global governance. John's now been with us, I believe, just, well, as of tomorrow, probably two months officially, uh, which I think is certainly long enough for him to appreciate what a marvelous opportunity is afforded by the Balsley School uh, and, the, and the partnership between University of Waterloo, Wilfrid Laurier University, and CG. At the same time, he's not been here long enough to try and figure out the road system. I've actually been here two and a half years and I still haven't figured it out. John Ravenhill's CV, for those of you who've had a chance to look at it, is truly astounding. Uh, there could be no doubt that we really truly lucked out in getting a scholar of his standing to come and be our director. Uh, and not simply in terms of the scholarly output, which itself is um, nothing short of spectacular could describe it, Author of some 20, author or editor of some 22 books, plus 173 articles or chapters. But beyond that, he's worked in so many exciting environments around the world, uh, bringing to us the uh, networks that's been formed in places like Virginia, Sydney, Edinburgh, before most recently spending time at the Australian National University, where he's head of the School of Politics and International Relations. And his own degree. If you, look, if you follow his genealogy, demonstrates that same level of engagement and crossing around the world, tapping into ideas and experiencing different environments. Um, his PhD was from Berkeley. He started off in Hull, England, but along the way he picked up a master's from Dalhousie. He truly is an example of engaged scholarship. In addition to his, his academic work as his Minister of Duties, he's been a consultant for the World Bank, the Korean Development Institute, and also the U.S. State Department. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming John Raymond Hill. Well, thank you very much indeed, Doug, for that very kind introduction. And welcome, everyone. And very grateful to you for coming out this evening. What I understand is sometimes referred to as mischief evening. Now, that's very tempting for anyone given the opportunity to have a podium here. Uh, my mischief this evening is actually going to be presenting a rather upbeat assessment on the state of global governance. And that may or may not uh, be controversial here. Uh, I look forward to your questions at the end of the presentation. The decision by the government of Saudi Arabia just two weeks ago not to take up the seat 
on the UN Security Council, to which it had just been elected, was seen by many as further testimony to a malaise in contemporary global governance. The Saudi action was unprecedented, turning down a position that most countries covet and on which they often invest years of diplomacy and substantial material resources. Moreover, the ostensible reason for the Saudi decision, its unhappiness with the behavior of the Security Council, was a reminder of the earlier failure of the UN's principal governing body to take effective action against the Syrian regime's use of chemical weapons against its own population. The initial gridlock in the Security Council on the Syrian issue reinforced perceptions of a broader crisis in global governance. Manifested elsewhere, as Doug mentioned, in the inability of the World Trade Organization to bring the Doha round of trade talks to a successful conclusion fully 12 years after this round was initiated. The lack of progress in global talks in the field of the environment and disappointment also with the lack of substantive outcomes from recent G20 summits. In this lecture, I will suggest that although there are certainly grounds for concern at the lack of progress on various dimensions of global governance, there is no crisis per se. One could actually argue that the lack of crisis is unfortunate because crises afford rare opportunities for change. That is, of course, when there is an appropriate response to them. The second theme in this lecture is that to conflate global governance with the problems faced by some international organizations is to misunderstand what global governance is all about and to interpret this concept far too narrowly. Third, I will suggest that we need a realistic approach to and a realistic appraisal of what international organizations can do. And I'll make the argument that all things considered, their record is quite impressive. Fourth, I will address some of the explanations for the contemporary malaise in global governance and find some of them wanting. Fifth, I will make some modest suggestions as to how we might move forward towards overcoming some of the blockages to make progress in global governance. Before I begin, I should make it clear where I'm coming from. I'm not a political philosopher, but rather an empirically oriented political economist. Thus, I've never found very helpful a great deal of writing on international organizations and global governance that rests on issuing imperatives. The international community must do this, must not do that. Similarly, I've never found useful those explanations for inaction on the part of the international community that rest on the notion of, quote, a failure of political will, unquote. Typically, this explanation leaves the key questions unaddressed. That is, why do governments or private actors have an interest or not have an interest in doing this or that? Why is there a failure of political will? I think that social scientists can do better than that. They can do better than issuing imperatives or resorting to explanations based on this vague idea of lack of political will. And for me, the attraction of the work of the great 19th century social theorists, whether Durkheim Marx or Weber, and here I've been in the community long enough that now I have to think twice about, is it Weber? Weber? Weber, right. 
was that uh, these theorists identified engines that drove social change. And indeed, in recent lectures in this series, we've seen fine examples of social scientists drawing conclusions from empirical work on what is working and what is not working in various areas of global governance. Let me turn first to the concept of crisis. One of the very first projects that I undertook after receiving my PhD was a collaborative research project on structural adjustment in Africa. I titled the edited book that came from this project, Africa in Economic Crisis. As a relatively young researcher with a newly minted PhD, much more confident in those days about what I knew than I am now, or in the very apt words, I'm sure many of you remember this one from Bob Dylan's song, Back Pages, for I was so much older then, I'm much younger now. I was particularly affronted when a reviewer of the book devoted much of the review to criticizing the use of crisis in the title. His point was that the economic problems that Africa was experiencing had been in existence for at least two decades. How then could this be a crisis, strictly speaking? And painful as it was for a new PhD, now becoming increasingly uncertain about what I actually knew. It was nonetheless something that I had to acknowledge. Strictly speaking, the reviewer was indeed correct. Because the origin of the word crisis, which came into Middle English via Latin, is the Greek verb to decide, originally applied to a turning point in a disease when important changes take place, leading either to recovery or death. And by the early 17th century, the term had come to be used more generally, but in reference to a decisive point, a turning point, or perhaps nowadays we'd say a tipping point. So we may have stalemate in various global negotiations but not a crisis. The protracted WTO, Doha Rang negotiations, are not a crisis. They may be coming to a crisis in the next month when governments have to make a decision whether to pronounce the patient to be dead. Genuine crises can be advantageous in governance at all levels. Many, many institutions follow an evolutionary, a path-dependent trajectory that is only rarely sent into a radical new direction, whether positive or negative, by a genuine crisis, by a punctuation of equilibrium, as it is sometimes expressed in the political science literature. Crises afford the opportunity for creative leadership, for the introduction of new ideas. The global financial crisis was indeed a genuine crisis and generated creative decision-making. The establishment of new institutions in global governance and the adaptation of others. The severity of the challenge was such that governments perceived it to be in their interests to bring about fundamental changes in global economic governance. And this leads me to my second point, to need to be clear about what we actually understand by global governance. The concept of global governance is a relatively recent one. The credit for its introduction is arguably uh, due to the late Jim Rosenau, Governance in its broadest sense refers to the making and implementation of rules and the exercise of power in a given domain. Writing at a time when theories of international relations were preoccupied with the consequences of the growth of interdependence, Jim Rose now argued that global governance was emerging as a consequence 
of the recognition of the need for new forms of governance in a world characterized by economic integration, but nonetheless a world that lacked an overarching political authority. Global governance, then, does not necessarily require the presence of an international organization. A body with headquarters, with concrete floors, with a permanent secretariat, etc. And it need not imply an arrangement that is dominated by states. Global governance can be, and indeed is increasingly being carried out in some domains by private sector actors. So even if we want to conclude that the performance of some international organizations is disappointing, this is not the only basis by which global governance should be judged, a point I'll return to later in this lecture. The concept of global governance from the early 1990s onwards quickly gained traction first through the establishment of the Commission on Go Global Governance in 1992, and then not least through the creation in 1995 of the journal Global Governance from the Academic Council on the United Nations System, whose secretariat we are delighted to house within the Balsili School. And over the years, it's become one of the most significant IR journals in the field. In evaluating the performance of global governance, we need to remember what a radical departure the whole idea was. For three centuries after the Treaty of Westphalia, the principles that states enjoyed unqualified sovereignty, that is, if they had the military prowess to defend their borders, this principle was unchallenged. Before 1945, Although we saw the emergence of some effective international organizations with limited functional competency, such as the Universal Postal Union, there really was very little intrusion on the sovereignty of states from global bodies. So our expectations of what international organizations and global governance more generally might achieve should be set in this historical context. The world remains one in which states pursue their interests as they perceive them, without any overarching authority. We may, in the words of one renowned international relations theorist, Hedley Bull, we may have elements of an international society in place where states perceive that they have some interests and values in common and consequently have agreed to be bound by a common set of rules. Nonetheless, it is still an anarchical society. Moreover, where international organizations have emerged, these are overwhelmingly intergovernmental in their structure. That is, their rules and procedures are set by their member states. That is, national states, of course. To be sure, creative leaders and secretariats can create some autonomy for themselves, free themselves to an extent from the shackles imposed by their members. And the study of how they do this and debates on the extent of their success makes for a fascinating literature in the field of international relations. But the scope that leaders and secretariats have to create such autonomy is limited. Given the control that member states exercise over international organizations through their executive boards and other bodies on which national states are represented, it is questionable whether it is appropriate in many instances to blame an international organization itself for the policies it pursues. Rather, it's more accurate to place blame on its principal stakeholders and the institutional structures that enable them to dictate policies. <clears throat> 
The other side of this coin is that one must be careful in attributing success to international organizations when success may owe much to the activities of individual countries, with the international organization itself serving primarily as a forum for the exchange of ideas and or as a mechanism for coordinating national actions. Nonetheless, international organizations, not least those within the UN family, have made a difference. The summary volume of the UN Intellectual History Project, titled UN Ideas That Changed the World, makes a compelling case how the work of UN agencies has changed not just our thinking, but also delivered very positive outcomes in areas as diverse as health, the environment, gender, development, peacekeeping, and human security. This upbeat assessment notwithstanding, there have been areas of significant failure. While few of us of the baby boomer generation deep at heart really believe that all you need is love would be sufficient to transform the world without an accompanying change in political structures, I think very few people expected that we would see the evil of genocide reemerge in the contemporary world, in Cambodia, in Bosnia, and in Rwanda. The emergence of evil while the international community stood by apparently incapable of meaningful action. In this context, the acceptance by the World Summit in 2005 of the principle of responsibility to protect, an idea formulated by the International Commission on Intervention and State Sovereignty, which the Government of Canada, of course, sponsored in September 2000, was an extremely encouraging development in global governance. I'd suggest a game changer. Indeed, despite problems in definition and in implementation, it represents a fundamental breakthrough in qualifying the principle of non-intervention in the affairs of sovereign states. In the words of a newly released CG Junior Fellows policy brief, and these are produced by students in the master's programs in the Balsili School and very kindly published by our partners at CG. I commend these to you. They're all on the CG website. In the words of one of these papers, there has been a, quote, cascading consensus, unquote, in support of responsibility to protect. And while, quote, prevention or protection will never be perfect endeavors, Perfect should not be the enemy of good, unquote. In my own area of research, which is mainly on global trade, the World Trade Organization has proved to be one of the most effective of international organizations. Now, you might reasonably ask, how can I possibly justify this conclusion when all that comes to many people's minds in thinking about the WTO is the anti-globalization protests that have accompanied many of the recent WTO ministerial meetings and its continued failure to bring the Doha round of negotiations to a successful conclusion. Well, I'd suggest several issues are pertinent here. First, I'd point to the radically different experience with global trade in the aftermath of the global financial crisis of 2008 to 2009, compared with the experience of the 1930s after the great crash of 1929. The immediate downturn in trade in 2008 to 2009 was actually greater than in the early part of the 1930s with total world trade falling by as much as 20% in the 12 months after April 2008. But global trade quickly bounced back so that by the third quarter of 2010, it had surpassed its previous peak. Uh, 
Given the economic difficulties that countries were facing, this was a remarkable turnaround and completely in contrast to the experience of the 1930s when global trade did not pick up and of course the economic problems that this contributed to in themselves created some of the political instability that led to the Second World War. To be sure, various factors were significant here beyond the activities of the WTO itself. National stimulus programs, the Group of 20 pledge on avoiding protectionist action, for instance. But one should not deny the contribution of the World Trade Organization itself. The socialization of countries into the norms of the institution. The monitoring program on trade responses to the global financial crisis that the WTO put in place. And the existence of legally binding dispute settlement mechanisms, something that was completely absent in the interwar years. The fact that the WTO is based on hard law, on detailed treaties that members must adhere to is, I'd suggest, a big plus, an advantage that it has over many other international organizations. An exclusive focus on stalemates in what, might term, what one might term the legislative side of WTO activities, that is the trade negotiation rounds, ignores many of the other areas where the WTO has made significant progress over the last two decades particularly its judicial activities through the dispute settlement mechanisms. One might reasonably argue that the creative interpretation by the dispute settlement panels of WTO case law has helped to extend its mandate, very similar to the way in which the European Court of Justice has used its interpretations of EU law to extend the competency of European institutions. We can also use the case of the WTO to address some questions about what is actually causing the stalemate in various areas of global governance. Some people say, well, this is simply a numbers problem. The world system is more diverse than it was a quarter of a century ago yet alone in the 1940s when the current global institutional architecture was designed. Few international organizations have been as significantly affected by a growth in numbers as the WTO, which because of the peculiar origins that the WTO had in a fairly narrow trade treaty, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, because of this, the WTO has never had the near universal membership characteristic of institutions within the UN family. Fully 32 countries have joined the WTO since its establishment in 1995, and this was the last of the successful rounds of trade negotiations that the WTO conducted. So that the WTO's membership has been increased by nearly a quarter since its foundation to a total now of 159, as opposed to the UN organizations, which typically have in the mid-190s uh, membership. To argue, however, that the principal problem preventing agreement within the WTO is one of numbers really misunderstands how it and many other international organizations actually operate. Although the WTO, unlike the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, has a system of one state, one vote, and operates on the principle of decision-making through consensus, in reality, it has been governed through a process of what international relations scholars refer to as minilateralism, a process where a relatively small group of key states have effectively made the decisions. To me, it is simply not credible to suggest that the accession of Albania 
the Lao People's Democratic Republic and Tonga to the WTO since 1995. That this is the reason why the current round of global trade talks is completely deadlocked. Rather, what is critical in understanding gridlock within the WTO is that the composition of the group of states that are a key part of the minilateral process has changed, in particular with the rise of the so-called BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China. For me, the key question for the immediate future of the WTO and indeed for other international organizations is whether the opposition that some of the BRICS are mounting to some of the proposals on the international agenda is in fact interest-based or principle-based. That is, whether it is primarily a distributional matter these states, like others, are simply pursuing their national interests and trying to maximize the deal that they can get, or whether it is principle-based in that they are fundamentally opposed to the norms and values of the particular institution or of current forms of global governance more generally. Although there have been cases, undoubtedly, where the BRICS have held neg negotiations hostage to score broader foreign policy points. They're certainly not unique in doing this. And generally, I found the behavior of the BRICS in the trade regime to be one of responsible stakeholders pursuing national interests, rather than one of countries that are opposed to the principal norms of the international system. The BRICS have also been accused of undermining the responsibility to protect process, most recently by preventing the Security Council from approving military intervention in Syria. Again, I don't think that this is an indication of an in principle opposition by the BRICS to responsibility to protect. All of the BRICS were, by chance, members of the Security Council at the time when it passed Resolution 1973 on humanitarian intervention in Libya. None of them voted against this resolution. They soon became alarmed, however, when they perceived that the invading forces had exceeded their mandate of humanitarian intervention and instead would stop at nothing less than regime change. This concern led the Brazilian government to propose a new principle that is responsibility while protecting, essentially a proposal that the scope of UN-backed intervention must be limited to the mandate provided by the international community. I see nothing wrong with this at all. Gareth Evans, co-chair of the ICISS and one of the strongest proponents of responsibility to protect, has argued that the Brazilian concerns representing those of a large number of developing countries are legitimate. They have to be taken seriously and that proportionality and monitoring should be key principles governing intervention. The bottom line here again is that while BRICS, the BRICS have expressed concern about the misuse of responsibility to protect, they have not opposed the principle per se. In the General Assembly debate on the Secretary General's report on implementing responsibility to protect, in 2009, only four governments called for a renegotiation of the 2005 agreement, Cuba, Venezuela, Sudan, and Nicaragua. Uh, 
A couple of others, Malaysia and Sri Lanka, have subsequently called for clarification of the concept. But overall, the level of support from key stakeholders in the system for R2P is very impressive. So despite the enormous changes that have occurred in the global system in the last quarter of a century, with the rise of the BRICS, a process that some have referred to as multipolarization, I think it's very difficult to argue that the world today is more divided than it was during the Cold War years. There are different lines of fracture within the global system, to be sure. But as evidence and support of my argument, I point you to the fact that more Security Council resolutions were agreed between 2002 and 2011 than in the entire four decades of the Cold War period between 1950 and 1990. So more in the first decade of this millennium than in the whole of the Cold War period. Interest-based disputes can certainly generate gridlock in international negotiations, but their implications from anyone with any enthusiasm for global governance are far less worrying than if systemically significant states are opposed in principle to the underlying norms of the contemporary system. So if I may return to the Doha round and try to draw lessons from what is going on there, what is actually blocking a successful outcome there? Negotiations that have been likened to, quote, watching paint that never dries, unquote. What are the broader implications from this stalemate? Well, first off, a large part of the problem has been the failure of the United States to play a leadership role. Washington has frequently been an obstacle to progress in the Doha Rand, primarily because of agricultural issues. And again, it's really rather unclear to many people why agriculture has figured so prominently in these negotiations, given that trade in agricultural products today comprises only 7%, 7% of world trade. Some would see that what has happened in the trade field is part of a broader abandoning by the United States of a responsible leadership role, a reflection that key domestic constituencies no longer perceive the benefits of the United States expending scarce resources to lead the global system. A second set of problems has arisen from European insistence on broadening the trade agenda by linking it to environmental and labor concerns. Now, while in principle such linkages might not be a bad thing, most trade negotiators believe that the prospects for a successful outcome are undermined when the topics under negotiation are expanded to those that are primarily the responsibility of other international agencies, such as the International Labour Organization. Keeping the agenda focused has also been a challenge for the Group of 20, a challenge that it has failed to meet successfully in recent years. A third factor in the failure was the perception by developing countries that their interests had been relatively neglected in previous rounds of trade talks. Talks and outcomes which forced them to make the bulk of concessions while receiving relatively little in return. Now this raises a broader set of issues back to what I had earlier suggested had made for effectiveness in trade negotiations, the fact that many countries, and this of course was primarily the developing countries, were largely excluded from key areas of the negotiations. So we have a classic trade-off here 
between, on the one hand, apparent effectiveness in negotiation and legitimacy of the outcome. A trade-off that has come back to haunt the WTO in its current round of negotiations. A fourth factor in the failure has been the conduct of the negotiations as a, to use WTO speak, quote, single undertaking, unquote. That is a complete and complex package in which nothing, nothing is agreed until everything is agreed. Now, the idea of package deals has long been attracted to students of international relations. It's certainly something that uh, was very much part of the training that I had as a graduate student. The logic being that if you have a package, then the longer the list of items being negotiated, the more chance that all parties will have an opportunity to gain, and the greater the prospects for trade-offs. I'll give you access to my market for financial services if you stop subsidizing your cotton growers. The interests of more domestic constituencies can be satisfied. And typically, the larger the package, the more players that are involved, then this is often advantageous for developing economies, for smaller economies that are able to act in coalition with others. But the experience in the Doha round and in climate change negotiations, as some of us heard from Mike Holm last week, has cast doubt on this conventional wisdom. We have seen instances in the latest trade negotiations where agreements that have been reached in one area, for instance, trade facilitation, have been held up because of disputes in other areas, such as agricultural trade. So going for an entire package has meant that nothing has been agreed. So the practice of issue linkage, which theorists of international negotiations used to see as beneficial, is not serving contemporary international negotiations well. The implication here is that one way forward in international negotiations is to break them up into smaller sets of talks, each with a narrower focus. And of course, to concentrate initially on those areas where a priori it appears that agreement is most likely. A complementary approach is to limit the number of states involved in a set of negotiations to those that have expressed an interest in moving forward on specific issues. This is an approach that produces what is sometimes referred to as a variable geometry of negotiations, or sometimes uh, without too much care about historical analogies to coalitions of the willing. The participants in talks will vary from one issue to another. The expectation is that the pathfinders, those wanting to move forward, will constitute a critical mass if this particular issue is to be negotiated successfully. They will be able to move forward. Others will then come to the party, either because they're persuaded that the agreement reached is worthwhile, something in it, or they fear that non-participants will be discriminated against. Now, one example, a contemporary example of this approach in the trade sphere is the current negotiations for a trade in services agreement that began in 2012. These negotiations initially among 23 WTO members are being held in Geneva, the home of the WTO, but not within the WTO itself. The idea being, well, let's get the trade negotiators who are Geneva-based together and then maybe others will come on board. Proponents of this approach to negotiations felt vindicated when China announced last month that it wanted to participate. And China's rethink on participation, I'd suggest, provides further support for my earlier argument that it and other of the major developing countries are not opposed to the fundamental norms of the current system. 
Both of these approaches of limiting the issues, of limiting the numbers, are a logical response to the argument that despite all the rhetoric about globalization and interdependence, there are actually relatively few global problems that cannot be broken down into components that are not global. Minilateral or plurilateral agreements, as they are sometimes called, bring us back, however, to a classic dilemma in international negotiations. The potential divergence between the effectiveness of the negotiating process on the one hand and the legitimacy of outcomes on the other. Is there any way of reconciling these two principles? One possible approach in the context of global environmental negotiations has been suggested by a former colleague of mine, Robin Eckersley. She suggests that negotiations should involve a combination of the most capable, the most responsible, and the most vulnerable. The most capable, the most responsible, and the most vulnerable. But this useful suggestion poses its own challenges. Can an agreement be reached on the criteria for defining these categories? And can subsequent agreement then be reached on who will represent, for instance, the most vulnerable? At the very beginning of this lecture, I cautioned about conflating the performance of global governance with that of international organizations. And yet I spent most of my time talking about international organizations. Well, let me try to rectify that a little bit by turning to private global governance. We are, in fact, seeing an ever greater reliance on private global governance. Many economic activities today are governed by trans transnational private rules. These rules are set by a range of non-governmental bodies, industry associations, NGOs, networks of firms, technical experts, groups of activists. Such agreements are by no means novel, but they have become increasingly pervasive for a number of reasons. First off, because of greater interconnectedness, openness, and uh, the freeing up of trade and investment then there is much greater economic interdependence than ever before. Take, for instance, the food supply chain in the United States. Traditionally, of course, the United States has been among the most self-sufficient of countries, but now it imports 60%, 60% of its consumption of fruit and vegetables. So some form of transnational monitoring of the supply chain is necessary to ensure quality control. A second factor is that governments have simply been slow to reach agreement, as we've seen in the trade talks, for instance. A third factor is that governments and private, sectors, private sector actors alike acknowledge that the private sector often has the technical competence needed to craft the rules in the area which needs to be regulated. This acknowledgement has been increasingly reflected, particularly within the European Union, in governments delegating the setting of standards to private sector bodies, sometimes after setting the broad principles that inform the regulatory framework. Prima facie, such an approach is attractive. One might reasonably assume that agreements are relatively easy to negotiate amongst private sector actors. They will involve relatively few players, all with a keen interest in the outcome. They may be less likely to be politicized, especially when they're concerned with technical standards. But note the emphasis relatively, less likely, not absolutely depoliticized, not really easy, but relatively easy. They may be more flexible 
than intergovernmental arrangements, since they don't need the approval of national legislatures for treaty changes, for instance. But attractive as private arrangements for global governance may be, they also have their own potential drawbacks. First, the problem of regulatory agencies being captured by those interests that they are supposed to regulate is not unique to governmental bodies. We saw the dangers of relying on private sector regulation in the global financial crisis when the ratings agencies that previously sold their assessment of financial instruments to investors were now being paid handsomely by those financial institutions whose products they were supposed to regulate. Secondly, asymmetries in the power of the various parties may be even greater in negotiations among private actors than among states. Take, for instance, the establishment of standards for food production through the association known as Global GAP, where GAP stands for Good Agricultural Practice. This association is dominated by large European supermarket groups that set standards for developing country producers, not just on food safety, but on environmental and labor issues. Again, one might say, not a bad thing in itself. But Global Gap has brought these issues, which developing economies have been keen to keep off the WTO agenda, into global trade through the back door through private sector action. Third, private groupings may intentionally subvert intergovernmental negotiations that are likely to produce outcomes less favorable to private interests and to powerful private interests. And Erica Leiner has demonstrated this in his study of the debt rescheduling negotiations. Private agreements, agreements that involve a mix of governments, private sector actors, NGOs, may well be the way to go in the future, but there will be a need to ensure both transparency and accountability. Finally, I wanted to return to the issue of leadership. The US seems incapable, while to many people's disappointment, China has simply been unwilling to take on a leadership role in the contemporary system, claiming I think not altogether convincingly, that as a developing economy, it is simply not well placed to play a leadership role. Leadership has been lacking in many international organizations, some of which give the impression of being little more than dispensers of patronage. We need to build in more regular reviews of these organizations, but here, I'm guilty of reverting to what I criticized at the beginning, that is the use of the imperative. We must do this. <laughs> what we must do is to analyze what is blocking reform. That's the imperative for academics. More generally, there remains enormous scope for middle powers to seize the initiative. And there can be few clearer examples of what a middle power can do to very positively affect the global system. Few clearer examples than the action that Canada took in promoting the responsibility to protect initiative. But with cutbacks in government expenditure, the governments of many middle powers are reducing the effectiveness of the instruments they have to wield influence. We've seen substantial reductions in funding for policy planning units within key ministries, especially foreign affairs, while development assistance programs that were promised to expand in recent years have been cut back or funding diverted, and this is particularly the case where I've just come from in Australia. Development assistance is now being used to turn back uh, the so-called boat people. Um, refugee boats um, or resettling them in ghastly conditions on neighboring South Pacific islands. So the aid budgets are now being used to fund purposes that have very little to do with the UN's Millennium 
development goals. In conclusion, we live in an imperfect world, a world where states still jealously guard their sovereignty, a world where the commitments to shared values is far from complete. In this context, global governance, as the distinguished Canadian political scientist and former UN official, John Ruggie, argued a long time ago, global governance is a highly demanding institutional form for which there is no historical precedent. Our expectations then of what global governance can deliver should be realistic. Despite the frustrations, the advances that have been made through global governance in the past half century have been impressive. In the opening words of a major report on global challenges published 10 days ago by the Balsili School's counterpart at Oxford University, the Martin School, now is the best time in history to be alive. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you very much. I've been asked to moderate uh, my own question and answer period, uh, which is maybe asking for more mischief. So I will be very happy to take questions. Um, we have, as usual, microphones on both sides of the stage. And I would ask you, as per the usual practice here, to please identify yourselves um, briefly and also, of course, to give me a question that I can answer within the time that remains. <laughs> so. Okay, I'm Gordon McBain. I'm a professor at Western University, that place down the road. I'm also the president-elect of something called the International Council for Science, which is a non-governmental international organization. I wonder if you could comment on, since we're looking for, let's say, ways we could play a role, whether you see the role, you talked about non-governmental organizations primarily from ones that had business partners, but I guess I see the role of science playing a role, at least internationally, which we unfortunately don't seem to be able to play a role nationally in this country at this time, to show my bias. But anyway, I'm supposed to not do that. Anyway, <laughs> any comments would be appreciated. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, I mean, NGOs are absolutely crucial and, and very often very positive actors uh, in the contemporary system of global governance. Uh, they bring expertise. They often have the opportunity, the time, to do those sorts of longer-term studies that governments, it seems, are incapable of funding at the present time within their own organizations. They bring networks of people together. Uh, in doing so, they often produce a change of ideas, uh, a new consensus. So uh, I'm a great fan of uh, the work of NGOs in general and, and think that they're absolutely central to the future of global governance uh, in all of those ways. Um, I'm not gonna comment on Canadian policy. I have only been here two months, so uh, oh, I'm happy to, to, to say all sorts of nasty things about Australian policy, especially since I'm unlikely to be heard in Australia at the present time. But. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, thanks. Name? Yes. My name is Akram, and I'm a <clears throat> pharmaceutical expert in manufacturing. I wonder if you can comment on the, you mentioned BRICS as compared to the another international organization. Is this to form a block against any international organization, say WHO, number one? And number two, what does the Canadian government do in, non, in, in conflicts, international conflicts, whether in defense, 
or in hunger. Thank you. Okay, I, I am certainly going to uh, sidestep any questions on Canada, as I say. Uh, my relatively brief experience here is uh, such that I'm still on a very steep learning curve on uh, what Canadian government policies are in various areas, not least higher education. Uh, so I'm going to focus on your first question about the BRICS. And I think the answer to that is it's, it's really too early to, to um, tell. I mean, as most people know, the idea of the BRICS came about through uh, the creative thought of an investment banker who identified these countries as the ones that were going to grow most rapidly in the next decade and two decades. Um, since then, of course, uh, some of the countries have fallen on relatively hard times. Um, growth rates in Brazil and in India have declined substantially uh, in the last couple of years. And so some of these original projections about the role of the BRICS uh, 25 years from now, I think, are looking decidedly shaky. This is a very interesting uh, case, though, where uh, you have a concept from an investment banker taking off as a, an intergovernmental organization, because the BRICS, of course, now have their own summit. They have been talking and, in principle, have agreed to establish a BRICS development bank. Whether or not uh, an enormous amount of money will be put into that by the various parties, again, is something that remains to be seen. Uh, my feeling is that on many issues, um, the BRICS have less in common with themselves than they do with other countries outside the group. So take Brazil and China, for instance. I mean, both might feel that they have um, been relatively neglected in the international system, um, but Brazil is a major exporter of commodities. China is the world's the largest consumer of um, raw materials now. Uh, it's not entirely clear that their interests coincide when it comes to pricing of iron ore or copper, for instance. So uh, it's, a, it's a rather uh, an economist answer on the one hand, but on the other. Um, uh, yes, I mean, it, it's fascinating the way in which this group has come together and has taken off. But if one looks at, in for instance, the G20, um, I don't get much sense of the BRICS acting together there on many issues. You see India acting um, with other countries on issues um, such as money laundering, for instance. Um, Brazil has its own interests in Australia on um, raw materials exports. And so I'm yet to be convinced that they are going to be a cohesive group in the long term in the global economy. Please. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Fatin Chowdhury. I'm here as part of the University of Waterloo Coalition for Sustainable Development. And we're actually heading out to the COP19 climate negotiations next week. Uh, we have a student delegation going. Um, so I guess I, in the context of um, environmental global governance, uh, what are some of our realistic expectations for COP19 that you can kind of comment on? So thank you. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm delighted first off that you have this opportunity to go. I and mean, I think that's really tremendous that our students uh, actually uh, are going to have that opportunity. Um, my expectations are very modest. Uh, I think that uh, the situation in the climate change negotiations is not at all good for the reasons that Mike Holm um, laid out last week. Uh, 
this is an area, I think, where the argument that one needs to move away from this huge package deal to break things down into uh, areas where progress seems more likely to be negotiated. Um, you know, this this uh, is as true in climate change as it is in trade negotiations. So I fear that those negotiations, rather like the Bali ministerial talks in the WTO, which come up next month, um, I wouldn't be wanting to invest a, a huge amount of money in expectation of a, a positive outcome from them at all. Good evening. My name is Ian Darling. I'm a journalist and author. I spend a lot of my time uh, interviewing people in the United States. Uh, I just wondered if you take a few moments to elaborate your ideas about the American system and the American people right now. Do you see the divisions in the United States giving that country greater uh, problems working with the rest of the world uh, in, the, in the years to come? Absolutely, uh, I do. Um, I think for friends of the United States, what is going on there in terms of congressional um, gridlock um, and the way in which that is impacting um, the capacity of the United States to operate internationally um, is very distressing. And from a foreign policy perspective, of course, the um, whole problem with the closing down of the uh, US government, uh, failure to reach agreement on um, an extension of, of financing for um, the US government uh, over the last couple of weeks prevented President Obama from attending important meetings in Asia, uh, the APEC meeting, and then a number of uh, bilateral meetings that he was scheduled um, to, uh, to make. Um, it wasn't unusual reading the press from around the region to see comments about, well, why is the United States ignoring the region? Um, and of course this happened at a time when uh, you had high level Chinese leaders visiting the region. And the contrast between the two reflected very poorly on the United States and its capacity to act. Uh, I find problems also um, in trade negotiations. If one looks at the Trans-Pacific Partnership negotiations, the major negotiations that are um, going on around the Asia-Pacific region, to which, of course, Canada is a party, uh, the difficulty in getting anything through Congress may well derail these negotiations altogether because Congress has uh, yet to give President Obama trade negotiations authority. And without this, it means that any trade agreement that is negotiated is subject to line by line negotiation um, with Congress. I don't think any trade partner of the United States is going to be willing to sign up for an agreement on these terms. And if you don't have the Trade Promotion Authority, which enables uh, the legislation to go through on an up or down vote in Congress, um, then um, there's no certainty for any trade partner. So, you know, once again, you have the problems of domestic politics and domestic gridlock within the United States affecting a key area of US foreign policy. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, there's an online question. Um, how do I see China-US relations in the near future and what challenges, opportunities um, does this relationship present for global governance? Well, probably it's the $64,000 question in terms of the future of the international system. Um, the relations between the two powers. And I would hesitate to try and uh, crystal ball gaze on, on this. 
what I would do um, from a political scientist point of view is make a number of observations. I mean, the first is that the process of power transition historically has been one of the most dangerous times in the international system. It's seldom been managed effectively. And the reason, of course, is often that the dominant power simply isn't willing to give the sorts of um, responsibilities to the rising power that the rising power wants to see. Uh, the history of US-China relations um, over the last 20 years, in some ways, has been, I think, quite positive. Um, the question, though, is can one really talk very meaningfully about China as a single entity, the United States as a single entity? And one of the issues, whether one's looking at China or the United States, uh, which factions in China are going to gain the ascendancy. And we've seen some worrying developments in the last few years, a much more aggressive stance by China on maritime disputes, um, reflecting undoubtedly the perspectives of the Chinese military. Uh, we have um, seen in Washington at times a move towards actions which seem to be designed to contain China, or at least insufficient attention to the way in which their actions are perceived. So that if we go back to this Trans-Pacific Partnership, this trade agreement, then um, a couple of years ago, I was at a conference in Beijing, and this was really before the TPP took off, and very few people had actually heard much about it at that time. And it was fascinating to me that uh, in an audience at uh, Peking University, how many of the questions were directed to this question of the TPP? And isn't this yet another effort by the United States to contain China? Now, I don't think that that is actually the motivation for the TPP, although at one stage, about 18 months or so ago, I mean, it was certainly presented as such by some defense um, interests in Washington. I think the TPP is all about setting the rules of the game in the Asia Pacific. But nonetheless, unless one can put oneself in the position of somebody sitting in Beijing, then I think there is always the risk of unintended consequences of something blowing up, um, being perceived to be something much more than it was actually intended to be. So um, not a very decisive answer there. I think there are real challenges in this adjustment. I actually see it as very positive that almost by accident, China is a permanent member of the UN Security Council, one of the P5, enjoys veto power. And so at least we don't have the situation, uh, as we would say if it was India rather than China, that was the rising power and not currently a permanent member of the Security Council. That would require what is going to be a very, very difficult set of negotiations, and I'm not at all um, confident that we're going to see any resolution of Security Council reform. I mean, this comes back to questions of legitimacy that uh, I was discussing at, at, at an earlier point in the lecture. Uh, yes, why should Britain be a permanent member of the Security Council, or France? It doesn't make sense. But what one then starts to ask is, well, when you start to unravel this existing formula, where do you draw the line? 
the four candidates that are lobbying very strongly for permanent membership, Brazil, India, oh, what are the others? Uh, <laughs> Brazil, India, um, <coughs> completely lost my uh, train of thought um, there. Germany, that's right, and Japan, thank you. <laughs> Brazil, India, uh, Germany, and Japan. Um, you might say, well, why those four? No African country? If Brazil, why not Indonesia? country of 130 million people, the world's largest Muslim country. So where do you draw the line? And so I, mean, I think that uh, we're either going to face a prolonged period of um, instability in terms of uh, trying to get the Security Council reformed, or we're just going to have to live with it in its present form. Uh, unsatisfactory as that may be to many countries. Okay, I think that we're running out of questions, so Deb, over to you. <laughs> John, I'd like to thank you on behalf of the audience that's here and everyone online and, of course, the Balsili School of International Affairs and its constituent partners, University of Waterloo, Wilfrid Laurier University, and our host, uh, CG, for that uh, engaging presentation, I think very thought-provoking. And I know for myself, as someone who's not an expert um, in international affairs, it's giving me um, a new framework in which to, uh, when I watch, the, watch or read or uh, listen to the media, to uh, look at the, uh, the uh, articles on uh, international affairs and global governance. So thank you very much. Yes, thank you, John, and uh, thank you to uh, Doug Pierce and Deb McClatchy for taking part tonight. Uh, you know, the, the Balsley School is a, is a unique school of international affairs, and uh, it's well positioned to, in fact, be an exceptional school of international affairs due to its partnership um, with a think tank, but uh, also and especially in the academic side and, and the curriculum and the faculty and the, and the, the amazing uh, caliber of students that it's attracting from around the world. Um, these two, uh, and in particular, these two exceptional universities, which, uh, you know, watch McLean's tomorrow, you'll see the, the new rankings coming out, and I have no doubt that uh, Laurier and Waterloo will once again shine brightly in the, uh, the Canadian academic constellations. So uh, the Balsley School benefits from all of these things, but I think now it also benefits from uh, the leadership of John Ravenhill, and we look forward to seeing all the uh, developments in the years to come with this uh, excellent uh, and preeminent scholar at the helm. So I just want to add that an edited video of this evening's live webcast will be posted to the CG website, and we'll also post a blog about this event where you can add your own comments. Our next two events in the CG Auditorium uh, next week on Thursday, November 7th, CG and the Balsley School jointly present a lecture by Sergei Khrushchev, son of former Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev. What might the next six years have looked like had the elder Khrushchev and then US President John F. Kennedy not had their terms in office cut short? And on Thursday, November 21st, you're welcome to attend our CG Cinema Series for a screening of Virtual JFK presented on the eve of the 50th anniversary of Kennedy's assassination. Be sure to register for our events newsletter for information on these and all of our other upcoming lectures, including our Cinema Series. Thank you again for coming to CG and have a safe journey home. Certainly long enough for him to appreciate what a marvelous opportunity is afforded by the Balsley School uh, and, the, and the partnership between University of Waterloo, Wilfrid Laurier University, and CG. At the same time, he's not been here long enough to try and figure out the road system. I've actually been here two and a half years and I still haven't figured it out. John Ravenhill's CV, for those of you who've had a chance to look at it, is truly astounding. Uh, there could be no doubt that we really truly lucked out in getting a scholar of his standing to come and be our director. Uh, 
Um, and not simply in terms of the scholarly output, which itself is um, nothing short of spectacular could describe it. Author of some 20, author or editor of some 22 books, plus 173 articles or chapters. But beyond that, he's worked in so many exciting environments around the world, uh, bringing to us the uh, networks has been formed in places like Virginia, Sydney, Edinburgh, before most recently spending time at the Australian National University where he's head of the School of Politics and International Relations. And his own degree, if you, look, if you follow his genealogy, demonstrates that same level of engagement and crossing around the world, tapping into ideas and experiencing different environments. Um, his PhD was from Berkeley. He started off in Hull, England, but along the way he picked up a master's from Dalhousie. He truly is an example of engaged scholarship. In addition to his, his academic work as his Minister of Duties, he's been a consultant for the World Bank, the Korean Development Institute, and also the U.S. State Department. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming John Raymond Hill. Well, thank you very much indeed, Doug, for that very kind introduction, and welcome everyone, and very grateful to you for coming out this evening, what I understand is sometimes referred to as mischief evening. Now, that's very tempting for anyone given the opportunity to have a podium here. Uh, my mischief this evening is actually going to be presenting a rather upbeat assessment on the state of global governance. And that may or may not uh, be controversial here. Uh, I look forward to your questions at the end of the presentation. The decision by the government of Saudi Arabia just two weeks ago not to take up the seat on the UN Security Council to which it had just been elected was seen by many as further testimony to a malaise in contemporary global governance. The Saudi action was unprecedented, turning down a position that most countries covet and on which they often invest years of diplomacy and substantial material resources. Moreover, the ostensible reason for the Saudi decision, its unhappiness with the behavior of the Security Council, was a reminder of the earlier failure of the UN's principal governing body to take effective action against the Syrian regime's use of chemical weapons against its own population. The initial gridlock in the Security Council on the Syrian issue reinforced perceptions of a broader crisis in global governance. Manifested elsewhere, as Doug mentioned, in the inability of the World Trade Organization to bring the Doha round of trade talks to a successful conclusion fully 12 years after this round was initiated. The lack of progress in global talks in the field of the environment and disappointment also with the lack of substantive outcomes from recent G20 summits. In this lecture, I will suggest that although there are certainly grounds for concern at the lack of progress on various dimensions of global governance, there is no crisis per se. One could actually argue that the lack of crisis is unfortunate because crises afford rare opportunities for change. That is, of course, when there is an appropriate response to them. The second theme in this lecture is that to conflate global governance with the problems faced by some international organizations is to misunderstand what global governance is all about and to interpret this concept far too narrowly. Third, I will suggest that we need a realistic approach to and a realistic appraisal of what international organizations can do. And I'll make the argument that all things considered, their record is quite impressive. Fourth, I will address some of G was a collaborative research project on structural adjustment in Africa. 
I titled the edited book that came from this project, Africa in Economic Crisis. As a relatively young researcher with a newly minted PhD, much more confident in those days about what I knew than I am now, or in the very apt words, I'm sure many of you remember this one from Bob Dylan's song, Back Pages, for I was so much older then, I'm much younger now. I was particularly affronted when a reviewer of the book devoted much of the review to criticizing the use of crisis in the title. His point was that the economic problems that Africa was experiencing had been in existence for at least two decades. How then could this be a crisis, strictly speaking? And painful as it was for a new PhD, now becoming increasingly uncertain about what I actually knew. It was nonetheless something that I had to acknowledge. Strictly speaking, the reviewer was indeed correct. Because the origin of the word crisis, which came into Middle English via Latin, is the Greek verb to decide, originally applied to a turning point in a disease when important changes take place, leading either to recovery or death. And by the early 17th century, the term had come to be used more generally, but in reference to a decisive point, a turning point, or perhaps nowadays we'd say a tipping point. So we may have stalemate in various global negotiations but not a crisis. The protracted WTO, Doha Rang negotiations, are not a crisis. They may be coming to a crisis in the next month when governments have to make a decision whether to pronounce the patient to be dead. Genuine crises can be advantageous in governance at all levels. Many, many institutions, the explanations for the contemporary malaise in global governance and find some of them wanting. Fifth, I will make some modest suggestions as to how we might move forward towards overcoming some of the blockages to make progress in global governance. Before I begin, I should make it clear where I'm coming from. I'm not a political philosopher, but rather an empirically oriented political economist. Thus, I've never found very helpful a great deal of writing on international organizations and global governance that rests on issuing imperatives. The international community must do this, must not do that. Similarly, I've never found useful those explanations for inaction on the part of the international community that rest on the notion of, quote, a failure of political will, unquote. Typically, this explanation leaves the key questions unaddressed. That is, why do governments or private actors have an interest or not have an interest in doing this or that? Why is there a failure of political will? I think that social scientists can do better than that. They can do better than issuing imperatives or resorting to explanations based on this vague idea of lack of political will. And for me, the attraction of the work of the great 19th century social theorists, whether Durkheim Marx or Weber, and here I've been in the community long enough that now I have to think twice about, is it Weber? Weber? Weber, right. <laughs> was that uh, these theorists identified engines that drove social change. And indeed, in recent lectures in this series, we've seen fine examples of social scientists drawing conclusions from empirical work 
on what is working and what is not working in various areas of global governance. Let me turn first to the concept of crisis. One of the very first projects that I undertook after receiving my PhD Ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Center for International Governance Innovation, or CG as we say. My name is Fred Kuntz, and I'm the Vice President of Public Affairs here at CG. I'd like to begin tonight by thanking our public event sponsor, Wordsworth Books, for their ongoing support of CG's signature lecture series. And I'd especially like to thank our event co-sponsor tonight, the Balsley School of International Affairs, for making this event possible. Welcome to those joining us from around the world through our live webcast. And following this evening's address, we welcome questions from both audiences at the microphones here at CG or through the live chat function if you're watching on screen. Please remember to state your name if you're asking a question and to keep the question brief. The question of the night is, is our system of global governance in crisis? Critics point to the failure of agreement on climate change, stalemates in World Trade Organization negotiations and deadlocks at the UN Security Council as well as failures at international financial institutions to avert the recent crisis. Tonight we have the privilege of hearing from John Ravenhill, newly appointed director of the Balsley School of International Affairs as he addresses this very question. Our introducer and our formal thanker this evening are from the two local universities which are partners with CG in the Balsley School that Professor Ravenhill leads. The introducer, Doug Piers, is the Dean of Arts at the University of Waterloo and prior to his appointment in July of this year, Doug was the Dean of Graduate Studies and the Associate Vice President Graduate at York University. He has also held senior administrative roles at the University of Calgary and at the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. And the vote of thanks later will be from Deb McClatch, who is Vice President Academic and Provost at Wilfrid Laurier University, and she was previously Dean of Science at Laurier and Dean of Science, Applied Science and Engineering at the University of New Brunswick and St. John. So please join me in welcoming Doug Pierce. Thanks, Fred. I'm delighted to be here tonight uh, to welcome John Ravenhill, who will bring a truly global experience and perspective to pressing questions of global governance. John's now been with us, I believe, just, well, as of tomorrow, probably two months officially, uh, which I think is 